All Things Alice. This podcast will explore the cultural phenomenon of Alice in Wonderland as artistic landmark and global symbol of inspiration and imagination. I'm your host, Frank Bedore, the author of the Looking Glass Wars trilogy. Let's explore what is it about Alice? My next guest is a collaborator and a friend of mine, David Sexton. He's worked as a writer and an artist for Marvel Comics. He's published two tarot decks. He's a dedicated advocate for art and culture in Miami Beach. And somehow, finding more time, he's written and produced for the stage, It's a Fabulous Life, The Nature of the Beach, and Blood, Sweat, and Mouseketeers. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, buddy. Hi. I'm... So excited to kind of redefine uh, and learn about you and sort of some of the, where some of the creativity came from. Because in, in preparing and going back and realizing how much work we've done together and how mm-hmm. you take my reimagining and reimagine it again, I really couldn't <laughs> keep up. And there, there, there is stuff that you created and artwork that you did that I, I, I was like, when did he do that? Why didn't we finish that project? Why did you do that? That's a valid question. <laughs> <laughs> right. For, well, remember, it, 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 you did that, um, that Kingdom of Cards, which was going to be a game idea, and you, you pitched oh, it yeah. to me. And then you did all these characters, and you, re, um, you were doing different spellings of the clubs, and um, you had Alice, uh, you had, uh, you spelled Alice, A-L-Y-Z-A, Alyssa, you know, and I was like, oh, I, I can't keep up with him. <laughs> He's changing everything much too fast. So, but wait, wait, so we, you have the art, you have the world creation, the magic, some of the science, we've talked about musicals, um, you know, you worked on the musical with me. Just take us back to David the Kid and what was going on in that mind of yours? Where did you put all the energy? What the fuck were you like as a kid? Well, I mean, I was always, I was much like I am today. I mean, yeah. That's really true. Like, I haven't, I really haven't changed much. And, and I, we moved around a lot when I was a kid. My dad had a job as a, a turnaround man. So we would go into a failing business and hmm. restructure it and fire the deadwood. And so we would move every year of my life, we moved. Okay, from so... From the time... Go ahead, go ahead. From, from like, you know, as soon as I can remember up until I was in high school, we moved every year. Yeah, so, so sort of a, uh, you know, an, an army kid, right? I mean... I was, was like an army brat, but yeah. without, you know, without any of without the, the, discipline. the uniform. <laughs> but wait a second, <laughs> because that's a really um, particular, uh, you know, a financial mind that your dad had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but your mind is everything I've seen is just firing creatively constantly, <laughs> not only in... Well, what I was going to, what yeah. I was going to say about ha- moving all that time... You know, I was always fitting into new environments, and, and so I learned to adapt to things, but also it pushed me inward some, right? Mm. Because my reality was constantly changing. Mm. So the only reality that I was, you know, that was a constant was my imagination. Wow. So I definitely, I world building, like I learned to tell myself my own stories and to create you know, characters in my head and do all that stuff when I was a kid, that was, that was consistent. Imagination was foundational and felt like a safe place for me because, uh, you know, you go to a different school every year, different kids, like that was hostile, you know, that was, that was challenging and, and difficult. But, um, my, my internal world was, was comforting and, and so I invested in that, and, and I feel like I still do. I still get a lot of joy out of inner inner journeys as much as I do. I'm super extroverted, you know that. Yeah, but I, that's I, for I sure. still have that side to me that that can just like walk for four hours and dream shit up. 
So did you have ki- did you have friends when you were a kid that you could share these stories or make believe or play or were you or were you on your own uh you know doing I, this I have a, a younger brother hmm. who would would definitely he was you know the Robin to my Batman like he was the sidekick mm-hmm. that I would like sort of you know bounce things off but but he was a uh, sort of a you know a passive participant in my craziness. Right. So he was there as a prop sometimes. Right. To, you know, to, to you, I, you're this, and I'm doing that, and you have to stop me because I'm going to do this. <laughs> like I was <laughs> generating the stories. So I mean, I I always was able to make friends wherever I went, but not I didn't share that inner world with people. I just didn't. That was my secret world. And I was probably afraid of judgment because, yeah. you know, it, it my brain can be a little crazy. And, well, and, you, know, you know, it works so fast. I mean, you're 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 on a level of, you know, ideas and and, and creativity. So, I, I you know, it's you sound like, a, you know, actors or 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 directors that I've heard of who, you know, are taking the family or the family pets and they're just creating all of the time <laughs> to, uh, you know, to to fulfill some kind of need. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what about your mom? Was she, cause you also, you know, you're also an accomplished writer. I mean, I love some of the things you've written. Thank you for that. And I, my, my parents are the most like wholesome Midwestern people. Um, they're, they're really, I mean, they're, I love them both. They're, so my mom is German. My dad is Irish and they both are great storytellers, which I feel like that's, Part of the part of what I love the most is storytelling, um, but I I think that I'm definitely an odd tangent of that of that you know group. They they're I, they were often puzzled. I could see it in their eyes. Like, <laughs> where did he come from? Wait, 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 wait. How, we might have picked up the wrong. How did kid. we make him? <laughs> Well, that's but, that's interesting because I, you know, I'm from uh, the Midwest, and I have, you know, I, yeah. I I would say the same thing. I had really great Midwest yeah, you're parents. Yeah, definitely your own uh, your own creation. Yeah, you know? and, and then so. it's like, okay, I have to get away from, I got to get away from here. Um, right. So I exactly. thought of myself more as the, of the black sheep because you know we had a mm-hmm. nice setup, and you know my brothers. And my sister, I have two brothers and a sister, and they still live where I grew up. Next, They all live in a row. They all live next to each other. Wow. So, which is brilliant, and I love going back, but uh, I had <laughs> you just... you can't stay there. <laughs> yeah, I can't stay there. And like you... you go back. <laughs> and like you, I ha- felt like I had, to, I had to stretch my imagination. And I love that we started this conversation with imagination because, you know, that's such a central theme for mm-hmm. for my book series and the way that you described it is exactly the thing I was trying to recapture as an adult. Um, you know, often people say, where did you come up with that idea? And you will be the first to say, it was popped into my imagination. And right. I just, I always, I always love that, but that always puzzled me because I always wanted it to, I wanted it to be more tangible. So that's why I turned Wonderland into the source and you clearly actually came from there because you've been, <laughs> you've been, you've been well, co- collaborating with me uh, for all these years, and uh, it's been it's and been I was magical. a fan first, right? Yeah, tell us. I was tell a me, fan first. Okay, so how did that? I did we meet at a comic con? Yes, yes. So I, but I had read the Looking Glass Wars. I, I really, I've always loved takes on on traditional fantasy. Like I, I love variations on Wizard of Oz. I'm always curious to see someone deconstruct an archetypal fairy tale or fantasy. I, I love that. And I, I was drawn to Looking Glass Wars and I read it and I, I thought it was amazing. And I was actually at Comic-Con because I was publishing, Marvel was doing my miniseries, Mystic Arcana. That's right. Um, that's right. And I was like, I was going around sharing the book with everybody, introducing myself. And I came to the, the Looking Glass Wars booth. And, you know, here I was feeling my own. So I was working for Marvel now and all that stuff. But I was like, oh, my gosh, 
Looking Glass Horse, uh, is Frank Bedore here? <laughs> and you, I, who's who I was uh, talking to, you sort of like opened your arms like a magician revealing a, you know, trigger, and you were like, I am Frank Bedore. <laughs> oh, really come great. on. <laughs> it was, uh, that's how I remember it. <laughs> oh, my God. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm a big fan. And so, and then I showed you the stuff that I was working on for Marvel, and you were like, wow, this is really cool. I think we immediately connected on that, like, Mutual like explorers in imagination wavelength. Yeah, and you know I follow I followed up and sent you a copy of the of the hardcover and the books when they came out, and that was the beginning. Yeah, Comic Cons they're they're remarkable because you know when I first started going I I I thought okay so they it's just comic books but it's all things pop culture and the thing that blew me away is how much reading reading deep you know, close reading and people would buy my book and come back the next day and say, okay, here's what I'm thinking. I'm like what? Right. You, you read it last night. I mean, there's really, <laughs> there's such an appetite for being, being an early adapter. Did you find that with your, you know, when you were there promoting your book? Um, uh, oh yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And just like you said though, right? These people went home and read your book because they knew you were going to be there the next day. Right. And they could have a face-to-face, -face, meaningful conversation with the creator himself. I mean, that's the thing that Comic-Con, which I, I dare say that, you know, over the years, it's gotten lost a little bit oh, yeah. for me. I remember back to the early Comic-Cons and, and the one I went to with you, like, there was a, a you know... Something's been lost in the mass discovery of it all. Yeah. There really was more of a. It was. It was more comfortable to have a conversation with creators and to. Yeah. You felt a little more embraced and and, and more it was, conversational. It was still. It was intimate. Um. Uh. You know. Even with the big publishers, it wasn't until the yeah. movie business took it over that you're competing yeah. with actors in you know stage eight or whatever that was, and it was like, oh, okay, everybody's passing you by. Um, right. However, the smaller Comic Cons or the other the Comic Cons around the country yeah. in Denver or right. Seattle, those picked up the slack, and those were places where you know people could come and really you know talk to creators. But yes. I, I got right. burned out on San Diego uh, yeah. as well. It just out it outgrew that that connectable connectability and and then you, you were like, what is it exactly? Because it. it you're right, it wasn't just comic, it, first it was just comic books, and then it wasn't just comic books, it was genre, which is, you know, then it was like, things related to comic books, and then it was science fiction and fantasy, and the, the tent kept getting bigger and bigger, then it was like, spy thrillers, and anything that ABC had on television, exactly. was at Comic Con, like, it became whatever, whatever the big corporate shills wanted to sh shill, yeah. and, they, and then the tent collapsed, because it got so big, yeah. that there yeah. was no, the, the t it didn't make sense anymore. Yeah, and they were taking know? all the billboards, and they were blowing it out, yeah. and, uh, you know, it took an hour to get in the, to the place, and uh, thank yeah. God I had a badge. I could have never walked around. <laughs> but, you uh, did right. you did you ever have ever have any um, cosplay um, characters for for your comic book or um, um, did you ever? No, I, don't, I mean, the, the the books that I wrote, yeah, um, were mar existing Marvel characters mm. that I sort of repurposed. I mean, talk about imagination. I, I think about that all the time. The the sort of mutually agreed upon set of rules and. There are thousands of people that have contributed to one story yes. at Marvel, and and I'm always fascinated about what what becomes canon, quote unquote, mm. what survives over the years, what gets ignored, what never gets picked up again. You know, it's that's a really cool experiment that's lasted for you know sixty years. I don't know how long Marvel's been. Well, long and, time. and and you know, look at that's what you thrusted me into when you were you know <laughs> when you were send me um, send me these ideas and you know I was uh -huh. trying I, I was still trying to you know find the right language and the right look and feel and I was trying to be consistent, right. but in <laughs> going back and seeing some of these. Some of these sketches, which I'll, you know, if we if we repurpose this into a interview or something, I'll mm -hmm. I'll post the the art. But um, 
Alyssa, she has, you know, super cool contemporary boots. She's got a wicked haircut. <laughs> it's got bangs. Oh, and yes, I remember sh- this now. I'm flashing in on that. Yeah, she's yeah. A, she had a, you know, real fantasy um, goth, um, you know, 90s vibe that, uh, you know, is... I think I was mashing up, too, because, you know, because it's never enough for me. Like, I was mashing up... Yes, it was a it was Wizard of Oz and 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 Alice in Wonderland. And yeah. somehow she was connected to Ozma and Alice and We should and actually do that though. I was recently I, oh, thinking listen, we I should we should that. do a story about those two. I mean the, the I, I, cross pollinization of that. Uh, I mean Exactly. Uh, I mean those two cuz when you we were talking about when did I discover Alice and I I just, you know, I remember Wizard of Oz and Alice sort of coming into my consciousness around the same time. And this idea of these tenacious female protagonists thrust into completely alien environments, but refusing to, to like, let it overwhelm them. And surrender, you know, right, there's, right. Yeah, there's something so compelling and interesting about those stories, and they do feel like they weave together in a way. Yeah, I really loved um, uh, The Wizard of Oz, uh, not that, not just because uh, Frank Baum's first name is Frank, and I think all great writers <laughs> start with Frank, but, <laughs> but uh, you know... Valid I, reason. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, what I love about, what I loved about it was that there was 13 books, and it kept going. Yeah, right. You know, with the Alice, there was just the two books, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I think about... Uh, um, you know the Dorothy Alice connection, as you just pointed out. So, so you know that was that that's self evident in 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 your in your art. And then you know forget about all the caterpillar stuff. Let's just talk about caterpillar <laughs> thread tech. So I'm just going to tell I'm just going to tell the uh, I just want to lay out the the groundwork because you you just mentioned something interesting about Marvel and all the thousands mm-hmm. of people that have contributed. And yeah. I, I've always thought that was, you know, really healthy and really an interesting way of expanding a universe and also to, you know, to have additional creative brain power. Because I've been working on right. the Looking Glass War since 2000. And, you know, yeah. quite frankly, I get burned out. So I call <laughs> David Sexton and go, OK, I got a new book. I, I need I need some I need some Sorry. magic. Bring me right. some magic. What do you think? <laughs> and you always deliver uh, in spades. Excuse the pun. And what's what was great about um, about that is okay. We're going to take the different caterpillar threads and we're going to give them powers. And right. you know you went you went off on that and it was amazing. Yeah. And then you took what how we started this conversation imagination and then you wanted to compare that to thread tech and, right. and and those things all were interwoven into my into my book um Hatter Madigan Ghost in the Hatbox so yeah. we had a big collaboration even though you yeah. were you know you know I, I didn't give you credit on the book because I'm so selfish but I'm giving you <laughs> I'm giving you credit now and because uh, wow it, I love it that's good because you did great late. it's never that's too great. late yeah I hope not well you know, I feel like, listen, I will say that I have always enjoyed collaborating with you and that you are a musish, a muse to me, right? You do stimulate what you're doing, always stimulates thoughts and things inside of me. And when I read that book and you were sort of like, I feel like it needs a little more math. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, what if? A little bit more then, showbiz. A bit more pizzazz. And then we just sort of wove, no pun intended, wove this idea of thread tech through various parts of it. And then you were like, oh, this is super cool. And then started incorporating it into the narrative. So it was definitely a, you know, a thing that we did together. And and, um, what, where did that, I mean, where did that, those ideas come from? Is that just that well-honed imagination and or were you riffing off of another idea that you might have had, or did you just rip off somebody? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I good, all valid questions. <laughs> um, I love si- magical systems. Yeah. When I worked for Marvel, 
you know, when I went and pitched my idea for the thing to Mar Marvel, I said, you, your science fiction entities and, and things are doing fantastically well, but your magic-oriented properties are failing. Doctor Strange had been started and canceled and started and canceled like dozens of times. And no one could seem to make that side of the Marvel Universe succeed. Uh, and I, I said to them, it's, it's because you have no rules. Hmm. You know, if, Doctor Strange is deus ex machina every time he arrives. Hmm. He's either, you know, whatever it is, it, it's always the solution. And what really good fantasy or magic writers do is they create rules and then subvert them in clever ways. I mean, yeah. J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter is a great example. She sets up very strict rules about how it works, and then she messes with you and takes you in unexpected ways. But I said, if there's no rules, then then there's no there's no risk because you're there's no box and there's no suspension of disbelief. There's no exactly because you really need a lot of parameters to, to suspend. So when I said that to Marvel, I was like, we need to we need to break down how magic works, and so. We created a series of, of, you know, ways of systems for magic in the Marvel Universe. And, and so that's something that always floats around in my head. Like, what, is, what are the rules for magic? And you had dark and light imagination as, your, as the sort of ground bedrock for the imagination rules. So I thought, okay, so it's about light. So then you break the spectrum of light into colors hmm. and and already you had your you know the blue caterpillar there are already colors connected with caterpillars so i was like so then what the the silk does is it it breaks this power of imagination down into a spectrum mm -hmm. and then what are the components of of a spectrum you know what it, what are these different colors stand for and what would be important if if Alice imagines, you know, a tree into being, well, what are the different things that make that, you know, actually happen? You know, it has to have strength. It has to have durability. It has to have, you know, energy. These various things that make something imagine, imagination into reality. So that's sort of how I worked backwards well you that. did it you did it fantastic and you made it very simple and because you used the color so you know green was for restorative and yellow was for energy and orange was for strength and and yeah. blue was for you know imagination so you had this very very you know it was sort of simple and understandable uh, color chart but then <laughs> to do what you said to subvert the the whatever the creation was you said well what if you combine them or mix them together yeah and then you used all these you know these other terms and it just it it, it really did create a magic system that was easy for me to take and um and run with and imbue the characters and so if alice had this imaginative power that was omnipotent almost our uh -huh. characters in the millinery they had to they had to create magic in the same way harry potter did and that oh was that was a fantastic gift um <laughs> and so you know who knew when you have to you're writing a book or creating a world you, you know you you have to have you have to have a magic system uh <laughs> maestro at your side <laughs> well you had created your own your a magic system that was the tenant of did, looking yeah. glass wars with the dark and the light imagination and how those affected each other and, and what the rules were for those. Um, so I like just, I, I varied that, which I think is what the best collaboration is, right? Yeah. Like I didn't try to totally throw something onto no. yours. I took what you did and I said, oh, what if we move, the, move this around a little bit and change it a little bit enough that we can, that it makes sense. It feels, it feels like that new rule system emerged from your rule system because that's what you have to you have. find out really quickly because if you start if you're writing chapters and your uh world creation uh rules are faulty you just write yourself into a corner and then you're like yeah. okay really that whole thing that i thought was going to work does not work 
I mean, right. and, and I remember, you know, okay, it's going to be through the pool of tears as one system. Oh, no, you can go through the mirrors, another system. Oh, no, you can do, I go, you can't do that. No, right, no, exactly. Like, you can do anything You're you want. You're breaking your own rule. Yeah. You, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I flailed along uh, when I was writing book one. It took me a long time because I kept making mistakes mm-hmm. on the world creation because I didn't have uh-huh. the, uh, me. yeah, I didn't have you next to me. Um, <laughs> But after three books and six graphic novels or something, I was really happy, uh, yes, especially yeah, with uh, I mean, especially with the Young Hatter. You were uh, yeah. you really you showed off your stuff because it wasn't just that. Remember, I called you. I said, "Okay, I need all the cool hats in the world so I can give my characters oh, names funny. based on hats." And uh, I think also too, you were like, actually, what you said was, "I need to, I need more." Um, variety in terms of the kinds of people that are populating oh, yes. the millinery. Oh, that's true. Like, I, it seems like it's all the same. Like, there's, it's a very vanilla ethnicity. And so I was like, oh, let's look at hats from all over the world. And, give and them... then that gives us a whole different feel of what that character is. Yeah. You know, if they're yeah. named, you know, whatever from the different hats. And so that was super fun. That, that, all that, and then what does that character look like? Who's, you know? Yeah, and and fed. you know, I haven't done a lot of character sketches on that, but that it, you're right. That that would be the lead, you know, idea. So wherever that hat is from, that's where the person is going to be from, um, yeah, or their sure. backstory. So, so that was uh, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, yeah. Hey, well, let me ask you about some of the things that you created. You created um, blood, sweat, and. Uh, mouse, uh, mouse of tears, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that was one of the first things you introduced me to. I think you were coming out here to do that show. Yeah. So and we're doing it. Plug. I'm doing her. Sh- we wrote a show, a holiday special that's happening at Green Room Forty Two. Um, I I don't know when this is going to air, so it might have already happened. Oh. But Green Room Green well, Room Forty Two did- in New York. Huh? When is it airing? And I'll try and get this up before that. Oh, December uh, 16th. Oh, that's not so, going to happen. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so you can so, talk about it in the past. Said, it was a fantastic show. It was a great show. <laughs> Nailed it. It was a great show. <laughs> um, but you know what's interesting about that that creation thing is that, so the show is based around a human um, named Lindsay Alley, who was a Mouseketeer on the, on the Mickey Mouse Club with Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake and Ryan Gosling and wow. all these enormously famous, they were all on the show. Carrie Russell, like, it, it's a crazy group of people. And Lindsay has done fine, but she's less famous than they are. So <laughs> It's the least <laughs> it's like famous her, one. Yeah, her quest for her own happily ever after, you know? When you're making six figures at the age of 12, wow, like it it, it messes with your head a little bit. And, and how has she processed through all of that? And we've been doing the show for 10 years now. Wow. We've done it all over the world. Um, like, you know, Mexico, Iceland, London. Like, we've done it all over, all over the U.S. Uh, and it, it has evolved and changed. But again, it's a situation where the stories are coming from her, essentially, because it's her life. And we've changed. She's gotten married. She's had a kid. And so... As that happened, so I'm sort of helping in her world creation <laughs> by taking bits and pieces of it and, 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 you know, highlighting it or adjusting it enough to get it to make it a script that's going to be really fun and funny for audiences. Oh, so, fun, fun. And, and so yeah. where are some of the places that you typically would uh, put this show up? Meaning, is so it... We- done it at at, a, at a studio at 54 below mm. in new york we just did it in palm springs we just did mm. it in la mm. um you weren't able to come to that one casita del campo we've done it at martinis above fourth in san diego oh fun we've done it in that's Ch- great chicago we've done it like you know all over the place probably one of the best shows we did it at uh, epcot oh um, fun and at uh, in Disney for about you know 500 people, uh, as part of the part of the 20 year Mickey Mouse Club reunion, um, and it was it was 
epic. It was really great. So, so how do you, um, you know, break up your your day? Because I know every day is different for you because you do so many different things. You know, I know you've created some reality shows that you were pitching. You do a lot yeah. of um, charitable charities and put on a lot of events. Um, you know, you occasionally will carve out a few minutes to write a blog for me. Um, (laughs) that's usually (laughs) under a thousand words. And, uh, despite the fact that it has to be a thousand. Uh, (laughs) So, but how, how does that unfold? I mean, how do you, uh, are you, do you you have a period where you're really creative, where you write, um, and then go off and definitely, I get up in the morning. I've been, I now I'm an early riser. I don't know what's happened to me, but I get up around 6 a.m. Mm. and I I have coffee and I have a super creative burst mm. of of things where I'm writing and I'm doing all kinds of things and, uh, and and then and then that sort of fades. But I will say, like I the the older I get, you know, it's all joy driven. Yes. Um. I it's like what what excites me and I feel so grateful that. You know, I can I can spend I can have a day where I write a blog post about Alice uh, in the voice of Bibwit Hart, and then I write fractured lyrics. This in the show that we're doing, we we're writing a song. I, we wrote a song about uh, how difficult it was to have for Lindsay to be with her two-year-old during COVID lockdown mm-hmm. to the tune of Evita's "Don't Cry for Me, Argentina," <laughs> and it's called. Don't quarantine with a toddler. <laughs> That's funny. Um, it's really funny. Like my days are just odd and and wonderful. You know? So so I, I want to go back to uh, a word that you t- has you described in uh, your life and the work and and that's joy, because yeah. I think a lot of folks, I think a lot of us struggle or, you know, people want to be creative. They, they want to have joy and they want to figure out how to do it, how to make money doing it. How do they find their inner voice? How, you know, how do I, you know, how do I make this a day-to-day part of my existence? Um, how have you been able to, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to, to have a day that starts with joy uh, and then have uh-huh. all this eclectic work? I mean, is it just relationship building over, you know, or is it, some of it's generated from you and well, why don't you answer instead of me answering? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I think I would be, I, I, it's an interesting question and I, I don't know that I could deep dive analyze into how I've managed to do it just to say that, you know, I, I, I do what I'm drawn to and what I'm passionate about and then honestly, the money has sort of followed. Mm. Sometimes slowly the money has followed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Both but, points are really valid. I mean, the idea yeah. that you, you're, you're choosing things that you love and sometimes yeah. the money is not everything that you would want it and it yeah. comes, it, but you're driven by, you're making the creative choice first, not the money yes. choice. That is 100% true. And I will say that I'm, I am, you know, I'm not driven by that. But eventually, like, people are like, we have to pay you for this. Like, yeah. actually, it comes from the other side sometimes. Like, I, you, you, uh, we're giving you money for this. And I'm like, oh, oh okay, yeah, that seems reasonable. Yeah. Since yeah. I'm so putting you, many hours into this. You didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> with your dad learning how to turn. I know. Like, exactly. like the financial <laughs> realities <laughs> of the world. <laughs> it's like, uh, son, um, I need to come in and restructure your life, your business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would be immediately fired. I think that would be the first thing you would do. Yeah. But, you know, like this thing that I'm doing... So I, I live in a little community. I mean, it's Miami Beach. It's not a little community, but a little section of Miami Beach. And I've been doing these community events because I just think it's everything that's wrong with the world right now is that we don't feel connected to people around us and, and where we are. And so we go online and we we create we find these faux communities that aren't really nurturing mm-hmm. or based in reality. Right. So, I mean... I, I believe that that community is super important. So 
I just started doing these community events um, to bring people together, find common cause. We disagree about so much, but we all love music. We all love art. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then eventually the city of Miami Beach was like, let us give you money to do more of these things, you know? Right. And, and I, I let them do that. So, you know, it's big yeah. on me. And, and you know, <laughs> but, you, you have a lot. I mean, isn't Art Basel, isn't that what it's called? Art our Basel, Basel. was just just happened. That just happened. That's and a big deal. And uh, there is a Comic Con down there now. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, Miami Beach is an oddly giant small town. You know, yeah. population wise, it's not that big, but it is the epicenter of a lot of different cultures. Um, and and so it's 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 very cool. It's a lot of different arts and 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 exposed to a lot of different things and influences here. So I, that's one of the things I love about it, you know? But yet at the same time you're doing that, you fly out and you pitched a couple of reality TV shows, as I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember having lunches and you telling me about yeah. it. And, um, and so those just come to mind or are there folks that you want to collaborate with and they make a lot of sense to turn into a reality show? Is I mean, that... I don't even know. I'm trying to remember how all that came to be. Well, I was, I, I had friends that were, that had a casting agency in, um, in LA and they decided that the casting part of it was the, the most important thing, right? Once you had the people then, and the actual concept was secondary hmm. in their, in their mind. So we began to sort of create, shows that they could cast that that we could pitch to network so it became a thing and and i actually worked with some amazing people um uh, bob mora who won an emmy award for amazing race and worked on top model and and um and we we put together cool show ideas and uh and pitched them and got all the way to close to the top close all, to the all the way to no all the way to no all the way to no um you know i i think we've shared the story like be doing that kind of a thing it's like it's like being a, a mother turtle in the galapagos islands right <laughs> you you give birth to a truckload of baby turtles and they all get eaten and you're thinking oh my god <laughs> <laughs> These turtles have got, there's so many of them. And you watch them scurry towards the ocean with all the confidence in the world. And then the hawks come and the seagulls and the things. And then you're like, are any of these turtles actually going to make it to the ocean? Oh, my God. You know? So it's hard if, for if, if Which the, is probably why I do, I do tend to do more theater and things that I can actually that I can bring to a conclusion. That's exactly um, the reason I started writing my, uh, my books. I mean, one of the reasons was sure. because I really wanted to have a, you know, a, a, a something to hold on to that was real. Yes. That was mine. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I could put out there. And then when I did graphic novels, they were like mini movies. There's a beginning, middle, right. and end. There's production, there's post-production, there's marketing. And um, I didn't feel as uh, beholden to, you know, pitching all the time. And... You understood what a good idea was. You didn't have to convince someone else who probably lacks imagination, to go back to our keyword, that, that this is a good idea. You knew it was a good idea, so you produced it, you, you put it all together, you put it out in the world, and people embraced it, you know? Yeah. As opposed to, you know, being in those pitch rooms, which can be tough sometimes. But the truth is, you the, the, the rejection is everywhere. So the first rejection was all of the... Um, the uh, literary agents, and then the <laughs> next was all the U.S. publishers, uh, all of which rejected it. Then it was all the British publishers, with the exception of one. And the only there reason it worked was because she was an editor who was she, she got promoted to um, publisher. So she still wanted to edit my book, but she was now in charge, so she could say yes. Have, had I not had Callie Poplack, my book would never have been published. Um, and so, you know, you face these, these, the, these um, rejections all of the time. It's really whether you have the fortitude and the perseverance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the drive, the love of the story, 
to to yes. to get it out yes. there. I mean, it's such right. a love story. You have to, you know, you have to fall. I mean, you're spending. Okay, this is my longest relationship, twenty two years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so it's irrational. It's it an is. irrational love. And you know, I go back to the the reason we fall in love with characters like Alice is that tenacity yes. that she is going to see this through. And Dorothy, I'm going to find that. I'm going to get to that wizard and no matter what happens. Like, I think that's why they speak to us um, in terms of heroes and heroines. You know, we're, we're all Alice. What was your first um, experience with, uh, with Alice in Wonderland and with the Wizard of Oz? Do you, do you recall? Oh, gosh, I don't, I, I don't know that I remember. I mean, I've, I'm a visual for I love reading and everything, but I do remember... Um, Alice illustrations uh, and being intrigued by that. And I'm sure my first encounter with The Wizard of Oz was probably the movie. Yeah, me too. Oh, abs- both were m- movies. Well, that's not true. I don't uh- know that I remember the Disney animated Alice movie. I don't remember. I actually sort of remember the first time I saw it, I was like, I don't like it. Yeah. Where- and-, and I think I already had Alice in my head and I didn't think it succeeded. So, but Wizard of Oz, definitely, it was the, you know. That movie, movie. I saw when I was young, uh, and I was like 40 and scared the hell out of me. No, I saw that movie when I was really young, (laughs) and I remember being terrified of those monkeys. And and so I created the Seekers in the Looking Glass Wars because I wanted to scare some other kid. Yeah, your books have some definite scariness in them yeah and one of my favorite things about like i think of it as a it's a thing i learned from frank fedor you open the book in the most hair-raising dangerous moment possible it's always like the first chapter and then you flash back to like <laughs> two years <Let's> earlier <laughs> slow it down yeah I, I i uh i wasn't a huge fan you know my grandmother's name was alice and so alice mm-hmm. in wonderland was my grandmother and my mother's favorite book and they loved it, and they wanted it to be my favorite book. But you know, I was you know I was reading adventure stories, and I what, yeah. what, what's with this girl going down? What I, this is this is stupid. I'm not reading this. But I, I had to I had to read it, and then I had to tell them about it. Uh, it wasn't until in college that I reread it, and was like, wow, this is this is amazing, um, because yeah. I really wanted those those thrills that I had from. The monkeys in the Wizard of Oz. That was so <laughs> yeah. creepy. Um, well, I think the challenge of Alice, the the original books, is that it's so episodic that the the encounters that she has don't seem to build on each other. Right? They're almost inter. You know, you could move them around in different orders. She she has this moment. They're moments mm-hmm. more than a string of a string of things that. You know, you have to do this in order to do that. You have to finish this in order to do that. And and that's and I think that's always the challenge of people adapting the book is that you have to sort of create a build to the to the adventures and the episodes. You know, obviously you did that by completely reimagining it, but it's what's wrong with the Disney movie. There's no climb. There's no you know, it doesn't build. Yeah, I mean, that's what I really tried to do. I, I tried to take all of the books that I read as a kid that had the the jeopardy and then all the stakes and then all the obstacles mm-hmm. and give um, Alice obstacles the whole way that we could see yeah. her sorting out um, that would be, you know, page turners. So there'd be, you know, uh, cliffhangers yeah. at the end of each chapter. And uh, I felt like that worked out uh worked out pretty well. And, um, you know, when I go to school events and, you know, particularly boys, boys just by nature, they don't read as much as girls. And so I, you know, I always thought of it as a, you know, as a book, it's about a queendom. It's about women. Women are in power. Yeah. It's the opposite of all the other <laughs> monarchies. And, and, um, and so, uh, but you know, the guys are, have all these cool, you know, weapons, and they have to support the women on their journey. Um, sure. And and it turned out that, uh, you know, it was became a pretty big boy book. And, of course, yeah. I have those card soldiers on the cover um, right. from D- Doug Chang from Star Wars. So. <laughs> but, 
you know, I, I always I wondered if, um, you know, especially now where the female protagonist is so um, so popular across right. all mediums, whether it's movies or certainly in television, um, wow. if we had promoted it as a, you know, as a more of a, I don't know if it would just be a, you know, a, a f- g- girl's book. They always say, oh, this is a girl's book or a boy's book right. because it was young adult. But mine always crossed over because we did those Comic Cons. And also, Hatter Manigan, you know, was a was sort of the breakout character. Yeah, he was. And I mean, he it, is. Yeah, a cool. He's like James Bond with a hat, you know, yeah. like he's, he's the action adventure guy. So for boys, I think he's sort of the, the draw into the story in a lot of ways. It's that, that action adventure side of it. Um, yeah. But I think Alice is a very relatable protagonist. Yeah, um, she was my favorite uh, character to write because she had that big story arc. And, um, yeah, you know, that whole thing about identity and, and trying to figure life out, um, you know, right. who's not doing that? I'm still trying yeah. to do that. I'm still trying to figure it out. When you stop doing that, you know, and that's when it's a problem. Let's talk about your interest in uh, musicals because, uh, you know, I've come to you and I've had to lean on you heavy <laughs> on the musical front. Um, you know, I've, I guess because of Wicked and because I know Gregory McGuire and Wicked yeah. was so successful and as a musical and, you know, and I always felt I wanted to do, try everything, even though I have no idea what I was doing. And clearly I wasn't <laughs> successful, but what I want to know about your, uh, musical background and, um, because you seem to know everybody in theater and what did it take to become, you know, a successful musical? Do you think, I mean, obviously great songs, but how do you come up with that stuff? Do you think? Well, I don't know that I have the secret to it, but I, I mean, I do, I do, uh, I've, been in, in, involved in musical theater for a long time and I am Richard J. Alexander is a great friend of mine he he was one of the original producers of Les Mis and Miss Saigon and he worked for Cameron McIntosh mm. um, and he directs Barbara Streisand and Bernadette Peters and uh, and so he's given me entree into a lot of those things and then another one of my good good friends is Robert Johansson who was the artistic director for Paper Mill Playhouse and now directs these amazing extravaganzas in South Korea, hmm. um, which is has a big market for that. Um, he's done uh, uh, The Man Who Laughs and Marie Antoinette, and which is a whole other world. But uh, a friend of mine who was just over there directing uh, a show for Netflix that was set in South Korea, um, the actors all knew who he was. They were like, oh, he's a big deal, you know, he's oh. a big deal over there. So anyway, um, I, I love musical theater. I, I'm, a, I'm attracted to it. There's something about the, the, the songs and the music of it and the story structure that, that is very fairy tale, obviously. You know, that, that when you talk about the structure of a musical, they talk about the I Want song. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, classic example is Part of Your World, um, you know, where the, the heroine tells you what they want. So to me, that seems very fairy tale and very um you know archetypal in, in its in the formatting and then so what i think is great about the musical theater is that there's such constraints on what you can do there right? really are, there are so many constraints then so then it becomes about cleverly subverting the rules and the expectations of of this very structured reality that's on that stage and i think that's to me the most exciting part of it um I mean, I I have a lot of friends that have, you know, done musicals and produced musicals and and been on the fringes of it. But I think um, I think it is really hard to to break break through and at this point in this moment in time, I've had small scale musicals that have been produced all over the country. Mm. Um, it's a fabulous life was my gay musical take on It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, oh which cool. Which is produced all over. The protagonist in, in, in It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart has a terrible day in which he was never born. In my show, the protagonist has this horrible holiday season. His parents won't, don't want him to bring his boyfriend home. He's have, struggling and he wishes he was never born gay. Oh, okay. And the Great. angel comes down and 
shows him what his life would have been like if he were straight. And at the end, he wishes he were gay. Like, he, he, he misses it and wants it back. So that's been done all over, but in small theater settings, right? You know, you, you, get, you get your shows produced around the country, but breaking that next level, getting it produced in a big uh, regional theater like Fifth Avenue or La Jolla Playhouse, I mean, that's really tricky to do. And then it's actually not that hard, I don't think, to, to get, your, get work produced region, in small theaters, right? Um, you can get it done, you know, at these, there's lots of different theaters that like doing new stuff, um, medium, medium level theaters even. But then when you're going to the next level, which are these large regional theaters like Fifth Avenue or La Jolla Playhouse, I mean, it's, it's a small amount of real estate. They do probably like four new shows a year and they get bazillions of, of requests and entries of fully formed already produced already you know here's the dv here's all the things of it so getting that done is is the next level of impossibility and then even more impossibly impossible is taking that leap to broadway i think it's it's really tricky and as we were saying earlier you know there's shows that that have been floating around and pushing and pushing for decades and finally something you know they have a, a publisher who's an editor or an editor who's a publisher. Like that that momentary break mm -hmm. and, and then they're all prepared and they can push through that tiny little aperture that's open for them. But it, I think it's really hard and you just have to do it sort of for the joy of it. Do you, why do you think, or ha have you seen any Alice's Adventures in Wonderland um, musicals? I know we once spoke of the musical Wonderland, I think it was called. But yeah, you don't, like Wild you don't Horns. yeah, you don't see a lot of attempts. You see a lot of people doing, you know, like, you know, small theaters or local theaters, and they, I guess, yeah. they do a play version of it. But a big musical, uh, a la Wicked, it's true. that that's it's true. I, I mean, I, I don't think I think we can safely say there's never been a successful version of it. Yeah, a la Wicked. You know, there's never been. I, I saw Frank Wildhorn's um, Wonderland, and I feel like the less said, the better. It just wasn't. It didn't succeed. Right. Um, <laughs> for for some of the reasons that we're talking, amazing cast, super talented. The music wasn't terrible. It wasn't the best. There were moments, but he didn't crack that thing. It never felt like there was a build of tension. There weren't stakes. It was... Alice meets this thing. They do a song. Alice meets yeah. This, so episodic you know, again, not they, going to and work. Episodic, and it's it's a trap that people can fall into when they're adapting that material because the base material is so structured that way. Um, that how that old become, how old was Alice in the musical? I'm curious. She was an ad adult. I think she was the do adult daughter of the original Alice. Was the conceit of it? So. She was cynical, and and I feel like that was sort of what they were trying to get at. But but it just didn't. It it didn't. I mean, there also hadn't been work. a there hadn't been a, a Wizard of Oz that was successful. There was the Wiz, but nothing successful until um, Gregory reinvented um, because he made it about um, the stakes between two sisters. Yeah. And, uh, well, and I would say that actually the Wiz was very successful, and Wicked has been successful. Yeah, I guess I would the say Wiz. there are two huge Broadway hits that were based on the Wizard of Oz material, and there has never been one for Alice in Wonderland, which is arguably as, as large an IP um, and as ripe an imagination thing. So they're waiting, Frank. Yeah, they're, so why can't it be... Why can't, well, you can't what, stop. you got to keep pushing I have it. To, to, I, I told you that I'm like super keen on uh, Barlow and Bear. Did I tell you that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, amazing. That would yeah, be so were. great. Uh, so I'm it, gonna... it, it, there's room for that. There's a space for what you're wanting to do. And I, I think that, you know, 
if there's room for it, you got to fill that room. It's yeah, and I, I, you know, it, it was, it's been very interesting learning, you know, the form because, you know, when you write a movie, it's very particular. When you yeah. uh, write a novel, graphic novel, and then when you get to, you know, they always say the book writer. I'm like, okay, well, how hard can the book writing be? It's so hard. <laughs> it's uh, so but, hard. But, you know, it, because you just, you're the bridge, right? You're that bridge to the song, and the song yeah, has yeah. to really move everything along emotionally, but... It's like, okay, what what information do I need? And, you know, you really have to, you know, cut yeah. back on the book and figure it out. It's not easy. I, I remember the first draft of the musical you sent me. I was like, this is a really nice screenplay. <laughs> but it doesn't, it's not a theater piece. Yeah. yeah. You know, you would, have, you would have characters coming in for like a tiny little thing. You would change this the set like it was a movie set. Like you were changing... <laughs> things would exist for two seconds and the thing I was like no, yeah, no, no, well, no. well we can't have five different sets in the first five <laughs> songs you were very yeah, sweet right. you were always very <laughs> gentle with me I want to thank you publicly for uh, not know, humiliating a, me no I was always you know because it, it was great for what it was which wasn't what you wanted, which is what you knew. Which, well, it wasn't great for a movie, and it wasn't great for him. It was a tweener, so it wasn't great for anything. But, <laughs> there you, go. you know, since I started working with my now fiance Teresa Lynn. Uh, she's I, amazing. She's, Shout out to Teresa Yeah, Lynn, well, you know, she's the Who smart. makes everybody she's around better. Yeah, that's for Let's sure. Let's face it. So, um, <laughs> so we, you know, we've, we've, we've. We've tweaked and worked on it, and, um, you know, but it's a whole different business animal yeah. um you know the the time the uh you know the creative force but what i love about it it's a small community and it's yeah. really just coming together with the composer and the lyricist and you know do we have enough time and do we have enough money to sit around and create these songs uh because yeah. it it's slow except for barlow and bear who you know created a whole album that won a grammy on TikTok, so uh, you know I'm too old for that. Exactly. So I need, I need, I need, I need them. But um, but that was really, you know, that was really fun. And and then I had hired that composer and that book writer, and and then you know I would always send it to you. I'm like, okay, I'm a little bit lost here. I knew it wasn't working, but I couldn't articulate right. why. I just said this doesn't feel right. I don't, I just don't feel the sequence. Um, so you know, thanks for thanks for jumping in and. Um, I also remember, I don't know, you might want to edit this out, <laughs> because I felt like the guy didn't really, didn't really understand, like he hadn't really embraced you, and, and one of the last drafts that came in before the reading, he had Alice doing like, Alakazunia, or some sort of magic word, and you were like, why, why is she doing that? And he goes, well, you know, it's, it's magic. And I was like, Oh my God! Did he read the book? Like, does he not understand how the ma of course magic systems? It's one of my pet peeves. But like, did he not understand? And, and no. then I, I was like, he really didn't spend enough time with the source material to properly adapt it. That's right. You know, That's and right, then yeah. to me that was a, a core problem you know, with with that process. I, I've worked with a lot of creative people, um, and I pride myself on giving folks a lot of room and yeah. wanting them to imbue the, the work with their own sensibilities, because that's what makes it kind of special and unique. But with this guy, um, we were just at odds, and, mm -hmm. and then it, he got really sarcastic with me mm -hmm. on the notes, and it was like, okay, this is over. And it yeah. was one of those, you know, just complete disconnects like it was better as a one night stand definitely not a uh, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not going to sustain and I was like your I was your friend who knew you were in a dysfunctional relationship yeah. <laughs> but like I I knew you had to figure that out for yourself <laughs> I was like I couldn't tell you cuz then you'd be like no actually and so I was like huh why do you think they do that right? <laughs> what, what do you think that's about <laughs> That's very true so, yeah, that's very true Yeah but but I really think that there is potential in it. So I think you should, you know, keep keep that. Send me send me your latest draft, and I'll I'll send you notes. Okay. So I um, I also <laughs> wanted to talk about that um, that uh, game, Kingdom of Cards, um, because uh -huh. you were doing the Animation Wars. 
Was that a project of yours, right? Yes. What oh, was... that's right. We were working on that. But was that mine? That was yours. That was separate. So <laughs> we were doing, I was working with this... Um, with game this developer, right? Game developer who was, you know, and, and I was also at the time working on an on a animation conference. And so I was connected In with... In Miami, right? With, Yes, the yeah. woman who was doing, she was a voice, uh, she was working for Disney in development, and she, and then another person who was doing voice casting. So I had all these different aspects of, of what it, what was happening to put together animation. So, and, and, you know, it was the reality TV world of the time. So I was, so we put together a, a show, a pilot of a show about these two teams that were working on um, you know, a concept and creating animation for this concept. And it was, it was a concept that was based on, on, you know, playing cards and, and, and things like that. I don't remember that much about it. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, that's, and, and then you said, oh, hey, here's, I'm working on this concept. I'm waiting for you to call me. Um, and I, I, and you were really excited cause you go, I can't really stop. I'm, and here's the art and, and then, but I, I, okay, I hope yeah. you like it. I'm waiting for a phone call. And uh, it was a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> did you go back and review some of my, my emails? I did. I went like, back. I was like, what were we doing in 2013? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we have a long. Yeah, we have a long two, history. I think in, in actually in 2010 or 2011 is when the, my, that Mystic Arcana came out. Mm, so, okay, yeah. Is that so was, possible? Yeah, it was right after the Alice movies were out, right? The um yeah. the, the Tim so, Burton thing. So Yeah. So um let me ask you if uh you how would you, wh which character from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland uh, uh who are you? Do I? Yeah, who would you describe who would you who would you pick? I I feel like I'm an I'm an Alice with the Queen of Hearts rising. Oh, like, I think so too. I think definitely. I think a lot of Queen of Hearts Rising. I mean, you know, yeah, you don't yeah. have you don't have the yeah you don't have the evil streak, but uh, you know. I definitely have. I'm bossy. Yeah, you're bossy. I like. I'm. I'm. You know. But I'll say that that Queen of Hearts and Alice both share a clarity of purpose and a and like a tenaciousness that yeah, I sort of yeah that's have. right. Uh, you know, and yeah. I feel like that's Alice is sort of the more inquisitive side and. And the Queen of Hearts is sort of the more uh, forceful side of that. That's in, but both of them are inside of me. Who do you think you're more, you're most like? I'd like to say uh, after this conversation, <laughs> the Mad Hatter. But uh. <laughs> no, I, I, I would say I always pick. You know, I also I would say I always pick Alice because of that. That that journey of identity is is something that I've wrestled with you know, uh, a long time. And uh, I, I, I put the dots together because, you know, I was, I was a sports guy in, when I was really young and I was really driven and I didn't understand why I was so driven. I, it wasn't that I wanted to, I needed to do it. And I really wanted to become, you know, the world champion. And I, I was talking to my daughter who plays soccer recently and I was showing her my diaries and I had to do a I had to do a, you know, a psychological report and it said, what do you think your biggest problem in life is? And I was 17 and I said that I haven't become the world champion. And so my point <laughs> is though, like I, I don't understand, I couldn't understand where that was coming from. And then I became the world champion the first time I won, not when I was the world champion, the first time I won, which was very yeah. hard. And I thought I was going to feel big and strong and different. And I didn't feel any different. And it was a huge letdown. I said, what have I been driving to do? I don't feel any different. And, wow. and then I said, the next day I woke up and then I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna lose this. <laughs> Whatever this is, it was because I had to identify with the winning of it and it wasn't ultimately fulfilling. And so yeah. my journey in life has been to find, to discover who I am and what drives me. And I had to go back and look like what damage, what, what um, trauma did I experience that required me to compensate so much for, mm. and, and, and that sort of drove me to show business and, and all of these things. So I, I, I really think of myself as 
I'm searching for an identity that I can land on, that I can have ownership of. And so that's why I think of Alice. Yeah, I, I think that's that's great. And and she's presented with all of these, you know, psychologically challenging situations that that, you know, trigger her to to un, to think about why we believe what we believe, right? Right. Why why is a raven like a writing desk like why is it why is this the social norm? Because that's what, yeah. you know, um, Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson was Lewis talking Carroll about. Carroll loved loved playing around with what 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 is actually wise versus what is perceived as wise. What is right versus what is perceived as right. Yeah, that's my favorite. So I think we fall into that all the time. Yeah, that's my favorite. My favorite quality uh, uh, about that, his books. Um, and uh, and what about the Looking Glass Wars? Which character? Um, oh, I think I think it's not a character. It's a thing. It's the heart crystal, the source of imagination. You are oh, you're in the embodiment oh of the gosh. heart crystal. That's David Sexton. The oh heart my crystal. gosh! Not I'm gonna, only I'm do you not, not I'm only so do not beautiful. only not only is it the source of for a Wonderland. It because you are communicating. It comes here. You're the source for all of our imagination. So you've been failing recently, given. All of the all of the facts are no longer facts, so you should go back and you're gonna have to work on work on your powers a little bit more <laughs> to heal yeah, the nation. Yeah, exactly. But that's a I think that's one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me. Well, that I'm the heart crystal. Yeah, that's it's, really sweet. It's very true. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, uh, I have a last question for you about. What is it about Alice and it's it's it, her staying power in pop culture? What and um, it's a two-parter because it's that, um, and then what in pop culture has moved you that is Alice related that people have been inspired, whether it's in music or a garden or you know, uh, film or TV. Does anything come to mind? Well, I mean, definitely, as we've been saying, it's this quality of someone who refuses to be lost and overwhelmed in overwhelming circumstances. I feel like, you know, me personally, as part of the LGBTQ community, um, you know, we all relate to Dorothy and Ozma or Dorothy and Alice because, you know, there's this, the world is confounding and, and mm -hmm. a little bit hostile and mm. we don't feel like we necessarily fit in with this crazy world that we're navigating through, but there's a, a, an intention and a purpose that moves us forward mm -hmm. um, that, that you know, is, is so admirable mm -hmm. and, and so meaningful. And I feel like that to me is probably, I think everybody feels that when they look at these protagonists, but for me particularly, that feeling of being a stranger in a strange land, like knowing that, that these rules, these conventions, these societal white picket fence ideas about what prosperity and happiness means, they don't apply to me. Right. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in Wonderland mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm observing these, these, these weird rules. Um, and so I feel like that's, that is probably why you know, Alice has maintained a pop culture presence because we always feel the falseness of of the pretensions of people in power in the world around us. You know, we're constantly made aware of, of the of the the falseness of the fairy tale and we have to try to see through that and get to the truth, which is what her goal is. Yeah, and I, I, I love that. I love what you just said. And I think that that last thing about getting to the truth, I think people want some truth um, in, yeah. in our in our day to day life. But it also speaks to the power of Alice to redefine the contemporary life. So, you know, in the 60s, it was sort of the drug culture of it, right? Mm. But now we're talking, you know, yeah, now we're talking about identity and talking about, Money. you know, how does it relate to what's real and what's, you know, fake? Right. Um, and the need for something, you know, genuine and something real and something dependable and something that, you know, everybody says a, a fact is a fact. Well, I think actually the drug culture at that time was looking for a, tr a kind of a truth yeah. that they felt 
they felt like the the you know the trip that they were on was in some ways more honest, right? Than this you know the war that they were seeing and and the and this you know the the Nixon of it all. Like it's that yeah. it's this idea of what is truth in that moment and what is the bullshit that pretends to be truth. But how um, amazing is it that Alice, which you know is the most quoted literary works behind the Bible is able to be that, um, uh, you know, flexible to represent, yeah. you know, I think it's just, it's, uh, it's the reason I have a podcast called all things Alice. <laughs> and it's the reason I had a powerful imagination and David Sexton on. Hey buddy, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your podcast and allowing me. I always think about this to play in your imagination playground. I always yeah. have a great time when I'm there. You're always welcome in my sandbox. Mm-hmm.